Amen. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with the family of God, Pathway Church. Man, God bless you. God bless you for who you are, for what you do. What a wonderful week we've had. Clark, thank you for being with us. I don't know where you are. Would you guys bless Clark one more time? So good. So good. And to our worship leaders, to the choir, man, we love you guys. Thank you for what you do. These guys hustle all the time. And uh, it's wonderful that we've got folks that are here in the house that love the Lord and are excellent in what they do. We're so thankful for you. I think we ought to just let them know we love them. Amen. Let's bless them really good. Today we close out our, our message series through Titus. It's been wonderful for me spending this time this summer in the book of Titus. And I'm so glad to have enjoyed it with you. And my prayer is that we'll continue to have a passion for the word of God. If we eat this book, we're going to be all right. If we hide this word in, in our heart, we're going to be all right. God's going to take care of us. He's going he's to continue to do good work in us. And so I anticipate that, that we're going to see harvest that, has come, that will come from the time that we've spent here. Uh, today we close this out with Paul's parting words to the church at Crete. And of course, in this passage, he does say, hey, go meet me at this place because we've got some more work to do. But he's definitely thinking about his next steps uh, for the church. And he's thinking about his successor and a number of other things, talking about uh, development. And today, that's really one of the questions I'd like for you to ask yourself, who is it that you're developing? It would be a terrible thing. Could you imagine if Paul had just finished his work and made no preparation for tomorrow and he just went on? we wouldn't be here today. And so we're thankful for godly leaders over the years, whatever capacities that, they've, that you've served in, that you have made arrangements for the handoff, that you've developed people so that when the handoff comes, then we're ready. And I would have been in bad shape if, you know, 15 years ago, I had just been thrown into the pulpit of Pathway Church. Little by little, the Lord progresses us. He develops us. He works on us. And you know what? We're still in process. God is developing us. Pathway Church, we are going to continue to grow and mature as we go. And I'm just thankful for what the Lord is doing in each one of us. Very thankful for that. A couple weeks ago, I was uh, with my parents and I was doing the really uh, wonderful work of helping them get to some things together uh, in preparation for moving. I don't know how it is for you when you move. Some people are just very, you know, you start and then you're finished unless you accidentally come across the box that has all the pictures in it. And then when you get to that box, you start going through these memories and you just grind, it's like somebody throws sand in all the gears and you just grind to a stop. And that's what happened to us. And it was wonderful going picture by picture through this gigantic box uh, of memories. And I came across a picture of me and my dad. This is one of the most awesome uh, mustaches from the 70s. And, uh, and now there I am hanging with my dad and, and you know, being with your dad. How many of you just love to be with your dad? Some of you wish you could be with your dad. Does everybody say, man, I wish I had just a few wish. You know, actually one of the kids in, our, in one of our children's homes, I saw they put on Facebook this week. They said something I would love to see. And there was a picture of an iPhone and it was an incoming call and it said, dad. And I thought, man, we're so blessed. Those of us that have had good, good fathers are incredibly blessed. Not everyone has that. And of course, when I saw that, tears immediately and then I went and commented right there. And I said, sweetheart, I'm so proud of you. You're such an amazing woman. I'm, you know, just to pour back into her. I'm so blessed to, to have a good dad. And uh, as I got older, as I got older, then, you know, you don't really have a sense for just how much you appreciate it. But I do know it came out in little things that I would say is I would say, daddy, I want to go with you when he was heading somewhere. And some of my favorite memories are standing next to my dad. You could never do this now. You'd be arrested for child abuse. But I would stand on the bench seat of my dad's old red flatbed truck. And we'd go down the road. I had my arm around him, you know. And, well, truth be told, I would also look down and I could see the road going by <laughs> through the floorboard of this old flatbed truck. It was awesome. We would swing off this truck. and Wonderful. And it just seemed like everything that we did was an adventure. I don't know that it was actually an adventure. I just know I was with my dad and that made everything more awesome. Well, two weeks ago when we were, when we were down visiting with my parents, I also wanted to see some friends and 
So I had had a coffee set up with Pastor Eddie Jervis and uh, with Pastor Jeremy Upton, two really amazing friends, and I was looking forward to catching up with them. And so I was getting ready in the morning, and my dad saw that I was getting ready to go, and he looked at me, and he asked, he said, well, where are you going? I told him, I'm going to see Pastor Eddie and Pastor Jeremy. We're going to have coffee. My dad says, son, do you mind if I go with you? Boom, full circle. Emotions rushed in, and I thought, what an awesome an awesome thing. This man that has invested in me and has developed me and, you know, has just poured into me. And, you know, it wasn't always good times. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it's rough, you know. My dad was this real softy. Sometimes I get in trouble. He says, son, going outside, I don't want to get blood on your mama's carpet, you know. <laughs> rough, rough stuff. Now, he never really said that. I just make that up. But it's, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Now, I get a spanking from my mom. I would always cry. I wanted her to know she did a really good job. <laughs> because if not, you know, my dad had to complete that sentence. <laughs> and uh, just really wonderful to then have this experience that the man that's developed me has, he, now want, he wants to be with me. And what a privilege it is to be able to spend our lives developing people. We look at the church and we think the church is a, it's a collection of people, you know, and people, when pastors go to places or, you know, even I heard it yesterday, uh, you know, you hear people say, well, how big is your church or what do you run or what is your attendance or what is your, that sort of thing. We think of the church as this big group of people. That's like kind of us when we get together, but really the church, it's a bunch of little interconnected relationships that are developing one another. And there's mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and spiritual cousins, and we're all investing in some way or another. But for the most part, you know, we're investing in a few relationships and we all kind of come together. And that's what I experienced with my father. And some of you experience that with one another. And I can even look, there are people that I'm investing in and people that are investing in me. It's incredible. As I thought about this little experience that I had, I thought about it all week. I shared this with the staff. I asked them on Monday or Tuesday, who is it that you're developing? Who are you developing? And I started thinking about back through my life. Who are the people that have developed me, that intentionally went after me to invest in my life, to craft me? I don't know that they just completely set out to, you know, do a particular thing, but they knew that there was something that was worth mining in my life and, and applying pressure and encouragement in, I guess, in, in scoops or measures that I could handle. And I started thinking, and I won't give you all the names, but there is one person I would like to share with you. When I was in the fourth and fifth grade, there was a sophomore in college. It was a part of our church. He had recently come to know Christ and he had got involved, took the Bible very literally when it said, that he should go into all the world and preach the gospel. He also took it very literally that you should go out two by two. And so he wasn't going to go out by himself, so he brought me along. And it was the, just the highlight of my week every Saturday that on Saturday mornings we would go out and knock on doors and we would specifically look for kids. So we would go to a neighborhood. And you see toys in the yard, then that's a house we're going to knock on. We're going to invite these kids to church. His name is Bob Baker. I have a picture of him. This is when I was in the fourth grade, you won't see me here, but that's Bob picking up kids, this young Christian actually doing what scripture tells him to do, believing that God is actually going to show up and do something, would bring, you know, 85, sometimes 130 kids to church every Sunday. And I got to go and be a part of that and building that little bus route on Saturdays, knocking on doors and Sundays going back. And I don't know who got the best into that deal. Those kids or me, it completely shaped my life. And I thank the Lord. And, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that as I'm saying this, you can also thank the Lord for the people that have developed you. I want you to do me a favor, just in your Bible or in your notes or whatever, just write down some names of people that have invested in your life and have developed you. And I want you to think about the qualities they had and the investment that they made in your life. I want you to be thinking a little bit later, who is it that you're developing? Who are the people that you're investing in? At the end of the message today, then we're going to bring our kids in from Kids Church, 
and we're going to pray for them as they get ready to go back to school. We're going to, we're going to bless them and, and their parents are going to step in. The teachers are, are going to come down and we're going, to, we're going to minister to them and ask that God would develop them, send them out. I want you to be thinking, who are the people and what are the things that you are doing to pass on what the Lord has given to you, what the Lord has done in your life? What, how is God going to use you? This was, these were the thoughts that were going through Paul's mind as he's writing the closing. That we're, all, all we're reading today, uh, Titus 3, verses 12 through 15, it's the closing. It's the last paragraph in a letter that you would write. For those of you that still write letters, I don't know how many of you do. You might, you might send nine or 10,000 text messages a month, but not a whole lot of people write letters. But you know that last paragraph, and then the sincerely, and then you sign your name. This is the part that we're reading. This is what's going through Paul's mind. He's thinking, as he writes to the church at Crete, all of this is about how they should lead in the church, how they should function in the church, how they can grow as a community. But the last thing on his mind, he's thinking about the people he's developing. And I want you to read, that, read along with me, Paul writes in Titus 3, verses 12 through 15. He says, I'm planning to send either Artemis or Tychicus to you. As soon as one of them arrives, do your best to meet me at Nic Nicopolis, for I've decided to stay there for the winter. Do everything you can to help Zenos Alaria. And of course, he's writing this to the church at Crete and to, to Titus. He says, do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos with their trip. And of course, maybe these other names don't jump out to you, but definitely Apollos does. Paul's writing in another place and he says he's addressing divisions in the church. And some people said, well, I'm of Paul. And others would say, I'm of a, Apollos. As in, like, this is the teacher that I follow. This is the rabbi that I listen to. This is my favorite preacher. And I'm sure that you all have those folks. Maybe some of you say, man, I love T.D. Jakes, you know. Get ready, get ready, get ready. You know, you're <laughs> or Jensen Franklin or Joel Osteen or whoever. I don't know. Your uncle. If somebody says, Pastor Travis, I'll pay you. <laughs> I don't know. But while there were those divisions, I think it's interesting that it, uh, Paul would say, take good care of Apollos. You know, let me, I'm probably getting ahead a little bit, but let me just kind of go with it here. Is that some of us don't celebrate others because our insecurity won't allow us to. We, we think if somebody else gets lifted up that it's going to diminish us. No, it's not going to diminish us. We are stronger the more leaders that we lift up, right? Now, if Apollos was attacking, going after Paul, and Paul was going after Apollos, and there were divisions in the church among leaders, then yeah, that's a problem, and you deal with that kind of stuff. But, you know, let me just put this out there. What Pathway Church need? look, we need strong leadership, first of all somebody's got to show the way. You walk into a place you've never been before. If nobody's saying, go this way, it's just a bunch of confusion. Why we need strong leaders? We need more leaders. We need more of you to rise to the challenge. The leaders, who are the leaders? Are they born or are they made? The leaders are people that simply rise to the occasion. And so Paul is saying, take care of these people. They're profitable to me. Leaders, good leaders are valuable. Take care of them, he's telling He's telling Titus, he's telling the church, take good care of these folks. Do everything that you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos with their trip. See that they are given everything they need. Our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive. So the goal is that the church will be productive. Church is productive when we produce good leaders. You see the body, you see the family working, you see that we're able to do things like the backpack giveaway and camp fusion camp and all of that. We're able to do that kind of stuff because good leaders are being productive. Take care of these folks, Paul says. And then he closes, he, he says, everybody here sends greetings. Please give my greetings to the believers, all who love us. <laughs> Apparently, the people that don't love us, forget them, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the people I love, and I know that feeling. I know that feeling. There's some people you want to see, and some other people you're like, dear Jesus, help those jokers, you know. And he says, may God's grace um, be with you all. And he closes this letter to the church at Crete. And I'm glad that Paul did a good job of developing. And my prayer is that we continue to walk in the tradition, in the legacy of developing people.
Let's develop more leaders. Take your eye off of the crowd. Thank God for the crowd. Thank God for what he's doing here. But if we want to continue to move forward, we will continue to develop and to fan into flame that fire, those embers that are burning within the hearts of people that God is doing something in them. So we want to continue to develop. And, and so along those lines, let me just give this to you, write it down, hang on to this, tuck this away, walk away with this. Life in the kingdom reproduces and develops more life-giving kingdom leaders. Leaders produce leaders. Leaders don't just produce followers. Leaders produce leaders. I don't want my kids just to do what I say. Now, I want them to do what I say. But when I'm there, not there to tell them, I want them to have a compass in their life that points the direction so that they know how to go and so that they can say to others, come and go with me. Or that as they're just going with people, you know, I think sometimes the Lord teaches us how to stand on our own so that when God puts people with us, we know how to stand when people are with us. Leaders produce leaders. Sheep produce sheep. Dogs produce dogs. Like produces like. If we want more leaders in the church, we need to be better leaders. The future of the church depends on it. The gospel, the kingdom of God in Mobile depends on it. The kingdom of God in your family depends on it. Dad, be a good dad for the glory of God. Mom, be a good mom for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lead well. And if you will lead well, your children have a better chance of being able to make it and to be able to lead well. Make the handoff. There is no success without a successor. It's an incredible privilege to shape and develop people. And at the end of the day, that's what we're after, what we are not after. We are not after building a crew of people that are simply consumers of spiritual goods and services. That you show up to the church and you put money in the plate. Listen, Pathway, put money in the plate. <laughs> I, let's get an amen on that, right? I mean, if we're going to build a robust church that is busting up the enemy in this town, we need to be faithful in bringing our first fruits to the Lord. Tithe. Give generously. Give extravagantly. If, look, if you think you can't afford to give, start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. Let God do with what you have what he wants to do. But God can't do with what you have if it's staying in your pockets. Everything that we need for the miracle is right here in this house. I want you to give. Don't get me wrong. In a little bit, Pastor Chad is going to come up and he's going to lead us in giving when he does respond and be obedient to the Lord, not only what Pastor Chad says, not only what I said, but what the scriptures say. But we are not spiritual consumers that put our quarters into the uh, vending machine, press B2, and out comes our spiritual snicker bar. And we walk away and say, man, church was really good today. I got the goosebumps. Holy Spirit must have been there. That's not, it's not just for us to come and kind of be fluffed up and to feel good thank God when there's a visitation thank the Lord that he inhabits the praises of his people aren't you glad for that today so glad but that's not the that's not the end game that's the fuel that's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to launch us out and I want to hear about how spiritual you are if you're not producing spiritual sons and daughters, you know? I'm not going to say we need to spend less time in the altar. We need to spend more time in the altar. But if we're spending time in the altar and we're not spending time with our coworkers and our neighbors, loving them into the kingdom of God, something is out of line. The goal isn't that we produce more spiritual consumers the goal is that we raise up secure, aggressive kingdom leaders who advance the mission of Jesus Christ in our family, in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, and in the uttermost parts of the world. That's the, that's the aim that we develop, that we mature. 
you're not a final product. You're still in process. God is still working in you. And there's none of us that are too mature. There, none of us have arrived at the X on the map. You're growing still. We're growing. I'm still maturing and growing. And, and I'm telling you, if there's anybody that feels like you have arrived, we haven't. Look, even Jesus grew. This rocked my world when I read this and, and just listened. Luke 2 and 52. I want you to read this with me. How many of you say, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me? Luke 2, 52, the Bible says, Jesus grew in wisdom. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. So Jesus, the Almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who's hung the stars in the sky, learned his alphabet. Jesus teethed. Jesus learned to walk. He learned how to be polite. He learned how to engage people. He grew because Joseph and Mary invested in him. He was fully God, fully man. It's called the hypostatic union. He was, it wasn't half and half. He was fully God, but fully man, and he grew, he developed, and we can grow and we can develop. The purpose of the church isn't to raise people just to do what we say, to keep people dependent on us. Your small group isn't just there to give you a crowd. Your small group is there for you to develop. Your children are there to develop. The people in your ministry area, they're there for, for you to develop. And then at some point, they launch out. And they go do what they've been taught to do because leaders produce leaders. Come on, help me out. Leaders produce leaders. So the aim isn't to take people from dependence into dependence. The goal is to take people from dependence into independence or interdependence. And then we grow and, and we mature. Is that where you want to be? You want to develop leaders? Who are you developing? Does anybody say, Pastor, I want to develop people? Whoever it is the Lord puts in my field, just go ahead and wave at me. You want to develop people. Okay, if that's so, then I want to give you two questions. I want to ask two questions. Number one, are you committed to being developed as a kingdom leader yourself? And the reason is because you can't take people to a place you haven't been yourself. So or, uh, let me just break it down the way I know how to break it down. <laughs> you got to be smoking what you're selling. <laughs> Yeah. We got, we, we've, got to, we've got to be in it. This Jesus thing is not something we just talk about. It's who we are. That, that's why we say he's a mighty God when we're on the mountaintop or in the valley. It just is what it is. You know, there, there's not a question mark here. It, God, if you heal me, I'll praise you. If you kill me, I'll praise you. Wherever you take me, this is who I am. So we have to be committed to being developed ourselves. And then two, who are you developing? So we start here. We start by saying that our walk with God is the foundation for our work with God. Our walk with God is the foundation for our work with God. We can't work for God if we're not walking with God. We can't build walls when our foundation is all busted up. Pathway Church, love Jesus. Read the Bible attend church. Don't forsake the assembling of one another together. Let's get together. Let's enjoy. Not only here, but go out to eat with somebody today. You invite somebody over. Football season is about to start. Throw open your doors. Invite people over. The better you cook, the more I want you to invite me over. <laughs> Spend time with one another. Love one another. They will know us by our love for one another. Love Jesus. Love God. Love man. Do that. You do those two things, that wraps up the whole Ten Commandments, all the laws. You do those two things and you won't lie. You won't cheat. You won't steal. Those are the negatives. The positives. Love Jesus. Love your neighbor. If you love Jesus, then you'll stop transgressing against him. If you transgress against him, you'll be quick to humble yourself before the Lord because God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Cast yourself on his mercy. Let's be a repenting church. Let's be a church that's quick to say, I'm sorry. A church that doesn't hold grudges. Families, don't hold grudges against your brother, sister. Pick up the phone. Text somebody. Stop that stuff. Right now, let's be done. Let's grow in the Lord. Amen? Is that good? We can live by That's good. There's life in that. There's life in that. 
Our walk with God is the foundation for our work with God. Paul tells Timothy, he warns Timothy of this, 1 Timothy 4.16. He says, keep a close watch on how you live, on how you live, and on your teaching. Not just your ministry, God is interested in you. And let me say to the, let me say to the worship team, to our worship leaders, Dana, what an awesome job you did this morning. Choir, let me say this. Hospitality team, front lines, tech. We got an amazing tech crew just looking back at the cameras. You guys are ridiculous. Awesome. Awesome. But let me tell you guys this. God loves you more than he loves your ministry. He's more interested in how you live than what you do. But if God, if you give God your heart, he'll use you and you'll do more than you could ever dream of. So our walk with God is our foundation for our work with God. My concern is that we would lose the warmth of God. Listen, we're going after this city. Let's not get so focused on going after the city that we stop going after Jesus. Let's be in, intent on him. Let me just give you some practical steps and then we're gonna have the kids come in. But I want, before the, before the kids roll in, I wanna give you some steps that you could use that will help you in developing people. How many of you, you could use some help? All of us, right? We're, we're growing, so we're learning. Eight things you can do to develop uh, kingdom-minded leaders. Number one, connect them into the life of the church. Let me just say, parents, you have kids at home? As long as they breathe your air, eat your food, sit at your table, sleep under your roof, bring them to church. And when they get out of there, how they are responsible, that's their problem. But until then, let's bring them into the house of the Lord. And if God is placing somebody in your life right now, at work, your neighbor, whatever, share the gospel with them, but bring them and connect them into the life of the church. If the Lord has introduced you to someone, there's, there's probably about, I don't know, 20 or so new families that are here just today, probably more because of this week. And there'll be people trying to find a way into the church Help connect people into the life of the church. Invite them to your small group. There's only a couple weeks left, a small group, before we start our fall semester. I don't care. Bring them into the end of your small group. That's fine. Connect people into the life of the church. Number two, worship with them. Now, you bring your boss to church. You bring your coworker to church. And then we start singing. And let me tell you, that's not a time for you to hold back and be respectable. That's a time for you to press into Jesus. Right? We're not hiding who we are. We don't want them to accept us. We want them to accept Jesus. So let's just keep pointing people to Jesus. So worship with them. Worship with your children. There's a reason why at night of worship we cancel all the kids' stuff except for the little babies and we bring them in. One of my favorite experiences when I'm standing there with my son or my daughter, now they're getting bigger and I'm, I look next door to my daughter. What's going on with that? And to feel like Blake pressed up against my chest and for him to hear the vibrations of my singing and my worship to the Lord through my chest. I want him to experience what it's like to worship with his family. Worship with them. Gather your family together. Gather your sons and daughters, your co-workers. Bring them together and worship. Even if it's just reading a little scripture, just maybe even an encouraging word, they don't even know what you're doing. Number three, help them, help shape them into gospel maturity. In fact, I want you to think of the people you're shaping like a block of wood or a block of ice or a block of stone. There's a masterpiece under there. You just can't see it. Right now, they're just a blockhead. You know, they're just a, they're just a chunk of something. But God is using you to shape them, just to chip away, to carve away a little bit here, to chip away a little there, or to melt away a little bit here. And at the end of the day, somewhere, somebody's going to step back and say, man, look at that great leader, that great man of God, that great woman of God. And you're thinking, man, you didn't know them. Shape them. Number four, help them value and honor leadership because you can't despise something you're asking them to be. Lift up and encourage leadership. Speak positively about the teachers. Don't down, their, they're getting ready to go into school. They're going to have some bad teachers, right? You're going to run across a bad police officer, right? You're going to face some things like that, but teach, peop, teach the people you're developing to honor those that are in authority over them. And some of the best teachers in your child's life may be some of the most difficult teachers in your child's life. God knows how to use it all. 
Number five, bring them into your journey. In other words, be real. Number six, give them increasing responsibility and authority. God didn't give you children or spiritual children so that you could just keep them under, their, under your wing. But God places people we're developing so that we can incrementally release them. Now stay close to them so that if there's a failure, it's not a catastrophic failure. If you do that, then one day they'll be able to lead on their own, potentially even with more competency and better skill than even you. But you don't get to do that if you arrest their development by failing to move in seasons and stages. Number seven, celebrate them, lift them up, encourage them, and finally, help them develop others. Make the handoff. Let's move this thing on along. Would you guys join me in that today? Would you join me in helping to develop the kids and sending them off into their school year well? Would you do that for me today? Would you bless our kids? Let's go ahead and stand. They're going to be coming in right now. And as they come in, I want you, here they come. Let's bless them really good. Let's honor, let's celebrate them. <laughs>